I'm so glad to be here today to just share with you about prayer and how it informs me as my ministry here on campus as assistant professor of ministry to women and the, the things that I teach in class. So I've been asked to talk about that, how it informs me as a teacher in my, my classes. And then I was also asked to share my journey in prayer, things that I've learned about prayer along the way. And hopefully that will be helpful for you as you seek to grow in your knowledge of how to seek the Lord in prayer. Um, I'm originally from North Alabama and moved to Memphis, Tennessee to attend seminary there. And while I was there, I was a member of different churches. One of those churches in particular was Grace Church Memphis. And um, the way that that church prayed really influenced me as a person. I need to do anything about that. Uh, so that church, they would spend an hour before the service started for just the covenant members to come together and pray through the scriptures. And so they would always have a theme each week. Um, and that was where I really began to learn corporately from other people on how to pray the scriptures. And that influenced a lot of what I'm going to talk about today. So again, my area of interest is ministry to women. And particularly, I seek to develop female leaders who will graduate from Southeastern with a greater love for God, for theology, and in particular, I hope that they will understand biblical theology and how to interpret the Bible well. So I'm going to hit on some of those areas. Um, prayer as it relates to leadership, as it relates to interpret, interpreting the Bible, and as it relates to biblical theology. So first, I just want to talk about how prayer is a mark of servant leadership and highlight how we see that in the scriptures. So my view of leadership is based upon the concept of servant leadership. We would probably all say that, right? When we look at leadership in the Bible, we see Jesus serving others, using himself and his position for the good of others, for the flourishing of other people. And if we are to be servant leaders in the church, how can we say that we are servant leaders if we are not, first of all, seeking the flourishing of others for them by the Spirit in prayer? And this is what we see of the leaders in the New Testament. Think about the Apostle Paul. Consider Paul as he prays for the church at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 3. You know that prayer there in Ephesians 3 where he says, For this reason I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. And I pray that he may grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power in your inner being through his spirit. So he prays for them that Christ might dwell in their hearts through faith. And he says this, he says, I pray that you being rooted and firmly established in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and width, height and depth of God's love and to know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge, that they would be filled with the fullness of God, that they would come into maturity in that love. So we see Paul as an example of a servant leader giving us a prayer to pray for those that, that we might be discipling or leading. But there's another example, maybe a not very well-known one, Epaphras, a member of the church of Colossae. Does anybody know what his example of prayer is? It's just in one little short verse at the end of Colossians. Colossians 4.12 says this, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus sends you greetings. And then Paul writes this about Epaphras. He is always wrestling for you in his prayers so that you can stand mature and fully assured in everything God wills. Are we giving up our time to wrestle in prayer for those who we care for and lead? But if we talk about servant leadership, surely we have to talk about the Lord Jesus himself and the model of prayer that he gives to us, particularly in John 17. We see that in John 17, verses 20 through 26. 
He's praying there for the disciples in that chapter, and then he begins to pray for those who come after them. He says, I pray not only for these, but also for those who believe in me through their word. May they all be one as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me so that they may be made completely one, that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. And so we see that the Father has sent the Son. The Son reveals the Father to us. The Spirit reveals the Son. And the Son is praying that as they are one in their unity as a triune God, that we would enter into that fellowship of unity with them. And I think this is such a, a needed prayer for us today to also come along and pray that same prayer that Jesus is praying because the church is so disunified. There's so much fighting going on in the church. And so Jesus, as a servant leader, prays for his church that they would be one as he is one with the Father. But we also have to think about this, that Jesus didn't just pray that in John 17 at that one moment in history, at one single time, but what is the work of the ascended Christ right now? Hebrews tells us that, that this is the ministry of Christ in heaven as a servant leader. He is at the right hand of God. And Hebrews 7.25 tells us what he is doing even now. It says, therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him since he always lives to intercede or to make intercession for them. This is the work of Jesus in heaven today making intercession for each one of us. So we've seen that prayer is a mark of servant leadership. But as for me, as I think through how prayer informs my area of teaching, I also want to model that for students. So number two, prayer must be wedded to Bible interpretation. So one of my favorite classes that I teach here, probably my most favorite class, is Bible Exposition for Ministry to Women. And I'm passionate about that course because I long for women to know how to read God's word and understand it and interpret it, exegete it, and teach it to others. At the end of that class, I have many times received comments from ladies who say things like, I wish I had learned these concepts sooner in church. Or things like, I now feel equipped to take a text and to teach it like I have never felt before. And so in that class, I seek to model prayer for them. I seek to incorporate praying through God's word over my students. I want to model for them how to pray God's word and in particular how to pray Psalm 119 for those who are struggling to love God's word, who struggle to understand it, and who struggle to apply it to their lives. So every semester when I teach this class, I take Psalm 119, and you know it's divided into 22 different stanzas, and I seek to pray through a stanza each week over the students. So in Psalm 119, for example, I just want to give you an example of like maybe what, like what week two would look like. So week two, we would pray over Psalm 119, verses 9 through 16, and I'm going to read those verses out loud, and I just want you to sit there and imagine, as, as I'm reading it out loud, Imagine that you're a student hearing this read and prayed over you um, as you seek to understand how to become a better interpreter of the scriptures. So verse 9 begins, How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping your word. I have sought you with all my heart. Don't let me wander from your commands. I have treasured your word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. Lord, may you be blessed. Teach me your statutes. With my lips, I proclaim all the judgments from your mouth. I rejoice in the way revealed by your decrees as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and think about your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. 
So in the class, it would go something like this. I would read over these verses, and then I would pray through them. So I'm taking the psalmist prayer, I'm praying through it, and then I'm adding words to it, applying it immediately to the lives of the students in the class, in specifically in relationship to interpreting and applying and obeying the Bible. So it would go something like this. I pray, God, that you would help us to keep our way pure by keeping your word. And then I ask the Lord to help us all to seek him with all of our hearts and that he would not let us wander from his commands. Now pray that the students would treasure God's word in their hearts so that they would not sin against him. And then I would request that, that the Lord would be blessed and praised and that he would teach us his statutes. And I pray that our class would learn to exegete and teach God's word and that we, with our lips, would proclaim all the judgments from the mouth of the Lord. And I beg God to help us to rejoice in the way that he has revealed to us by his decrees and that we would rejoice in them as much as we would rejoice in riches. And then I seek the Lord's help in our meditation upon his word, asking that he would enable us to mull over the precepts in the Bible helping us to constantly think about that while we are studying. And then I ask that the fruit of these requests would, res would result in our class collectively delighting in God's statutes, and that because of that, we would be able to declare with the psalmist that we do not forget God's word. So not only do I encourage praying through God's word in my Bible interpretation course, but I emphasize for the class um, in that class, meditating on God's word. And that, that is one of the keys to correctly interpreting the scriptures. So did you know that one of the Hebrew words for meditate simply means to mutter, just to mutter to yourself? So as we pray God's word, as we are in conversation with him, and we're muttering to ourselves God's word, we're asking God's help as we turn these phrases and words of Scripture over and over in our mind. And we speak it out loud to Him, and we seek His help. So we wed together, praying and meditating upon the Word of God. And these put us in a place to exegete a text properly. We are positioning ourselves in prayer and meditation. So we're reflecting to God a humble attitude that's saying to him, I don't understand this. I, I need the help of the Spirit. I don't quite get this concept. Help me, Holy Spirit. As you carried along men to write these very words that I am now engaging with, with my mind, help me to understand. Open my eyes that I might see. Open my ears that I might hear. And so in that sense, prayer is informing the work of exposition as we commune with God, seeking his help to see that which we can't see. Well, we've been talking about prayer as a mark of a servant leader. We've been talking about prayer as a means to inform Bible interpretation, how it should be wedded together. And now I want to talk about the last thing, that prayer finds its pattern in the Bible. So one area I mentioned was biblical theology that I really enjoy studying and I love thinking through the themes of scripture, creation, fall, redemption, restoration, how the overarching storyline of scripture reveals to us so many things about our God. Um, and last summer, I was asked to teach a, a course for BWI on prayer, and I was also at the same time, after being asked to teach that course on prayer, I was also contacted by my former church in Memphis to come and lead a retreat on prayer for the women of, of that church. And so I began to study prayer in the Bible in relationship to biblical theology of those categories, creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. And through that study, I came across the very first time that prayer is mentioned in the Bible. Does anybody know where it prayer is mentioned the first time in the Bible. Anybody have any idea? Not that we see a prayer, but that it's mentioned. Exactly. Yes. So the first mention of prayer comes pretty early. 
there in Genesis 4. So remember in Genesis 3, if you remember, Adam and Eve fall into sin, and God is giving in Genesis 3 these consequences, right, for sin, the curses for sin to the man and to the woman. And we all know in, in the midst of those pronouncements of judgment on sin, the Lord then gives the hope of the gospel in Genesis 3.15, even in the midst of his cursing of the serpent. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So we know this is nothing short of a promise of a savior to come who will crush the head of the serpent. And this verse is hinting at the hope of the gospel, the promise of of a Messiah, the birth of a son to come who will crush the serpent. So once Eve has a child, she says about her firstborn, she says this, I have had a male child with the Lord's help in Genesis 4, 1. But we know that Cain, after he grows up, he doesn't please the Lord with his offering. He gets jealous of Abel. He kills Abel, murders him. So here we find Eve in this chapter left without a son. And then her other son, who is left, is banished uh, in the middle of chapter 4. So where is the fulfillment of God's promise to Eve in Genesis 3.15? And this leads to prayer, the prayers of God's people, which you just noted. At the very end, in verses 25 through 26 of Genesis 4, it says this, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. So Gary Miller has written a book called Calling on the Name of the Lord, A Biblical Theology of Prayer. And he says this about those verses. He says, there is a growing sense that the promise of Genesis 3.15 may not be fulfilled immediately. The expected offspring is clearly neither Cain, nor Abel, nor Seth, nor Enosh. And it seems that at this point, the realization begins to dawn on the Adamic community that the fulfillment of the promise may take some time. In context, this is the most natural explanation of the fact that Enosh's birth leads the people to calling on the name of Yahweh. So Miller then defines prayer as this. Prayer throughout the Bible is to be primarily understood as asking God to come through on what he has already promised. Prayer is primarily understood as asking God to come through on what he has already promised. And so then he goes on and unpacks this throughout his book and talks about all the, the biblical prayers in the Old Testament moving to the New Testament. I can't walk us through all of that, but he says this about them all. He says, the biblical trajectory of praying is a cry for God to do what he has promised, to deal with the reality of sin by delivering on his covenant promises and then he says, then the peripheral categories such as praise, lament, intercession, or meditation on God's word take their meaning and boundaries from this covenantal approach to prayer. So if the trajectory of prayer in the Bible is a cry for God to do what he has promised, well, how does that apply to us today? Uh, early on, we saw that there was a promise given of a Messiah to come who would crush the head of the serpent. And we know that to be Jesus, the Son of God, who became incarnate, who lived that sinless life, perfect life. He was crucified, dead, buried, raised on the third day. The Messiah has come. Genesis 3.15 has been fulfilled. Those prayers have been answered. So how does it apply to us today? Well, there are many more promises for us to pray. There's more for us to ask of God, that he might come through on what he has said. And mainly we know that while Jesus ascended into heaven, he did promise to return again and set up his kingdom here on earth. So the Messiah's work was to make atonement for sin so that we might live in God's 
presence in eternity. And so now we find ourselves right now in the midst of this broken, hurting world, death all around us, and we're waiting for King Jesus to come, to come back as he promised, to do what he said, to set up his righteous reign here. We long for him to usher in this kingdom of righteousness so that we might be with him forever in the new heavens and the new earth. So that is our prayer. We are desperate and crying for God to do what he has promised. And so this cry finds its fullest expression in the pattern provided for us in the Lord's Prayer. So my own journey into prayer, uh, learning how to pray, even goes back to a time before my parents were believers and we were in a mainline Protestant church that really didn't even preach the gospel. I grew up in the Episcopal Church it has its roots, if you're, if you're not familiar with it, has its roots in the Anglican Church in England, which was born out of the English Reformation. And that church today, even though they don't preach the gospel, they use the Book of Common Prayer, which is filled with scripture. So it was through the weekly liturgy in that church of worship, using the Book of Common Prayer, that I grew to memorize things like the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed, a confession for sin, and the Lord's Prayer. And so while I am certainly a Southern Baptist by conviction, I still make use of these rich resources and incorporate the prayers of the Book of Common Prayer into my daily life. So sometimes I do what is called the daily office, which comes from the Book of Common Prayer. Is anyone in here familiar with the daily office? make use of it. Okay, well, you can find it online, Daily Office. Just Google that um, if you're interested in learning about it. What it is is basically a guide of worship throughout the day. It gives you scriptures to read. Um, it gives you prayers to pray. And it really does these for you th throughout the day four times. So there's a set for morning prayer, a set for midday prayer at lunch, and a set for evening prayer and then what is called compline, C-O-M-P-L-I-N-E. Compline, which are the prayers that you would pray before you go to bed. So praying through the daily office is really a way for me to reorient my mind back to the scriptures and worshiping God. To be honest with you, I don't do this every single day, but often I start to do this again when I'm really struggling with things like fear and worry and anxiety and hardship. But there are two prayers from the daily office that I pray every single day. Every single morning as I get ready for work, I normally listen to a sermon. And then as I'm driving into work, I have about a 20 minute drive. I'm praying through these things and listening to prayer and worship music. So I pray through the confession of sin and then the Lord's prayer. And then that leads me to put on the armor of God every single day. So I want to share with you what this looks like for me. The first thing I pray is the confession of sin. And it goes like this from the Book of Common Prayer. You might have heard it. Uh, and they say we because they're corporately confessing God. But I'm going to change it to I because I do it by myself. Most merciful God, I confess that I have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what I have done and by what I have left undone. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved my neighbors as myself. I am truly sorry, and I humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on me and forgive me, that I might delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. So when I'm reciting these words, they're not just rote words just to be said but I'm thinking about what they mean and I'm confessing known sin and areas of struggle. And I particularly think through the ways that I have not loved God with my whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, and the ways I have not loved my neighbors as myself. And I confess those things as they come to mind. And then that leads me into praying through the Lord's Prayer, which, as you know, is our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day 
our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So when I pray through this, I don't just recite those words either as a rote way of praying. But I break them down into the areas that Luther uh, noted in his catechism. So you can also Google this as well and see how Luther talks about it in his catechism. So he teaches us to pray according to the pattern of the Lord's Prayer. And he says that it's divided into these parts. The introduction, seven petitions, and the conclusion. The introduction, seven petitions, and the conclusion. So let's look at each one of those divisions. And then I'll offer a few sentences of commentary from Luther in his catechism. And then I want to help you think through ways that you can pray through each one of these areas of the Lord's Prayer. So Luther notes that the introduction is our Father who art in heaven. Luther writes this. He says, let's pray that God would hereby tenderly invite us to believe that he is our true Father and that we are his true children so that we may ask him with all boldness and confidence as children ask their dear Father. So as I meditate on this and pray through it, I recite and recall to mind the truths of the gospel and how when Jesus arose, he said to the disciples, I'm going to my God and your God, my Father and your Father. And because of Jesus and the gospel, I can now be in God's presence and pray to him as Father and enter in before him and cast all my cares upon him, for he cares for me. That leads to petition one, hallowed be thy name. So Luther says this, God's name is certainly holy in itself, but we pray in this petition that it may be holy among us also. So I meditate on this phrase and pray through it, and I remember in Proverbs where it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So I ask that God would help me to fear his name, to hallow his name, to honor his name as holy, not just with words, but with my life, my very life, that it would reflect that I honor him and reverence him. And I pray that God's name not only would be revered and hallowed in my own life, but be revered and hallowed in my marriage and in my church and here at Southeastern. And I can, you can go on for days and days on praying for God's name to be hallowed in many ways. Well, petition two is, thy kingdom come. So Luther says this, the kingdom of God certainly comes of itself without any of our prayers, but we pray in this petition that it may come to us also. The kingdom of God, he says, comes when our heavenly Father gives us his Holy Spirit, so that by his grace we believe his holy word and live godly lives here in time and hereafter in eternity. So when I meditate on this phrase, when I pray through it, I pray with John in Revelation, come quickly, Lord Jesus, doing, asking God to do that which he has promised, specifically that Jesus would come back and set up his righteous rule and reign. So I pray that, that Jesus would return today and that he would gather his elect from the four corners of the earth, that the dead in Christ would be raised, that we would all gather and meet him in the air and then that he would bring us all together and set up his reign on earth. But if he should so tarry, I pray that his kingdom would come in me through the preaching of the gospel, that I would go and announce the good news of the kingdom to others, and that I would live a life that reflects the ethics of the kingdom. So I pray that God's kingdom would come in me, come in me and my husband Tony and what Tony does. He's a biblical counselor at Bridge Haven over in Durham. I pray that God's kingdom would come through Summit Church where I'm a member, that all of the pastors and elders of Summit Church would cling to the gospel and they would be about the work of the kingdom. I pray for Southeastern. I pray for our cabinet members by name, that they would know the gospel, cling to the gospel, and that God, they would be used of God here to bring about his kingdom on earth. I pray for Wake Forest and our governing leaders here in Wake Forest and RDU and 
North Carolina and the United States. I pray for President Biden and Kamala Harris and the Senate and the Congress. It can just lead you to so many things of praying that God's kingdom would come, that he would send revival here in our nation if he doesn't return today. You can go on and on with that. And then I pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Luther says, the good and gracious will of God is certainly done without our prayer, but we pray in this petition that it may be done also among us. So he goes on, he says, God's will is done when he breaks and hinders every evil counsel and will, will which would not let us hallow his name nor let his kingdom come, such as the will of the devil, the world, and our flesh. But God strengthens and keeps us steadfast in his word and in faith till the end. This is his good and gracious will. So as I think through this phrase, I pray that, I pray in a way that positions myself in, as submissive to the lordship and the kingship of Christ. And so I verbally confess, Lord, you are king, you are God. I ask that the Lord would give me the ability to obey his will and his revealed will in his word. I ask that I would obey his statutes and commands, that phrase that we see over and over in Psalm 119. I often think about having read through the Bible, and when you read through the Old Testament, how Israel often is described as hard-necked, stiff-necked, hard-hearted, and proud, and that causes them to turn away from God and turn to idols. So I pray that the Lord would help me not to be a hard-hearted person. He'd help me not to be a stiff-necked, proud person, and that he would give me humility, and I would be committed to his will on earth and not my own desires or my own plan or my own will. And then petition four is, give us this day our daily bread. Luther says this, God certainly gives daily bread without our prayers, even to all the wicked. But we pray in this petition that he would lead us to acknowledge this and to receive our daily bread with thanksgiving. And he goes on, it's not just daily bread. It includes all these things, food, drink, clothing, shoes, house, home, fields, cattle, money, goods a spouse and children, good government, good weather, peace, health, honors. It could go on forever. So this phrase causes me to position myself in a place of dependence. We're in a wealthy society. We can go buy the bread we need. But to pray, Lord, give me this day, my daily bread, reminds me that while I think I can go get these things, I'm really dependent on the goodness of the Lord to provide them for me. And I thank the Lord for all the ways that he has blessed me and my husband and asked that we would be good stewards of our time, talent, and resources. But beyond that, I think about the word is our daily bread and Christ is the bread of life. So I also ask for communion with Christ through the daily bread of the word. Well, petition five says, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Luther says, we pray in this petition that our Father in heaven would not look upon our sins nor on their account deny our prayer. For we are not worthy of anything we ask, neither have we deserved it. But we pray that he would give us everything by grace. For we daily sin much and deserve nothing but punishment. And we, on our part, will heartily forgive and readily do good to those who sin against us. So having already prayed at the beginning through the confession of prayer that I spoke about earlier, I take this phrase and I begin to recognize that I should have an attitude of forgiveness towards others in the same way that the Lord has forgiven me. So I begin to meditate on the ways the Lord has graciously and lavishly forgiven me. So I ask that I would exhibit the fruit of the Spirit, and that I would be enabled to forgive and be patient and kind and loving and self-controlled in all of my responses to and interactions with others throughout the day. And I might think about particular areas where maybe I'm in conflict with another person, a family member or a friend, and I pray for help to be forgiving. Well. Petition six is, lead us not into temptation. Luther says this, God certainly tempts no one to sin, but we pray in this petition that God would guard us and keep us 
so that the devil, the world, and our own flesh may not deceive us or lead us into misbelief, despair, or other shameful sin and vice. And though we be thus tempted, that we may still in the end overcome and retain the victory. So when I pray through this phrase, ask the Lord to help me to walk in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I specifically ask for help to flee from sin so that I might not dishonor Christ, dishonor his name, dishonor his church, and even as a faculty member, dishonor Southeastern. So this positions me in a state of dependence upon the Lord, knowing that I can fall into sin, and I need to ask for his help to help me to turn away from worldly, ungodly things that might draw me into sin. And that leads to petition seven, deliver us from evil. Luther says, we pray in this petition as the sum of all that our Father in heaven would deliver us from every evil of body and soul, property and honor. And at last, when the hour of death shall come, he will grant us a blessed end and graciously take us from this valley of sorrows to himself in heaven. So in praying through this part, I begin to be reminded that I am in the midst of a spiritual battle daily. My husband often reminds me, because of his work in biblical counseling, that we have an enemy who wants to kill us, to steal and destroy. So I ask that God would deliver me from the attacks of the enemy. And at this point, I shift into praying through the armor of God putting on God's armor every day. So I put on the helmet of salvation and recite and trust in that I am God's child. I put on the breastplate of righteousness, the very righteousness of Christ that's been imputed to my account, credited to my account. And so out of that, drawing upon the righteousness of Christ to live a godly life, put on the belt of truth. I think this one is so key that everything about our life would be girded up in truth, that we would speak truth, that we would believe truth, that we would discern truth from error, that we would perceive what the reality of a situation is. And I specifically pray that I would cling to true doctrine, that I wouldn't go to the right or to the left, but I would say steadfast, on the faith once for all delivered to the saints. I take up the shield of faith, and I ask that I would have faith in God and Christ and his spirit, and that the darts of the enemy would be, they would come to nothing. And I take up the sword of the spirit, God's word, and ask that he would help me to fight all my battles throughout the day with his word. And I pray that I would stand ready to share the gospel and that I would stand in the truth of the gospel. And finally, I pray that I would pray at all times in the spirit as I go throughout the day living in God's kingdom. So then finally, we come to the conclusion of the Lord's Prayer, which says, For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Luther writes this about the amen at the end. He says, Amen means that we should be sure that these petitions are acceptable to our Father in heaven and are heard by him, for he himself has commanded us so to pray and has promised to hear us. Amen, amen. That is, yes, yes, it shall be so. So I, I simply pray when I get to this, Lord, all that I have prayed is for your kingdom. Do this, Lord, for your glory according to your power. Amen. So I seek to pray this every single day. And I challenge you, I want to challenge you if you have not incorporated this into your prayer life, to begin praying through the Lord's Prayer every day according to this pattern that Jesus has given us. I do this because I know who I am when I don't pray through these things. I know who I am and how I will act. And I know what kind of person I will be if I don't seek the Lord's help daily to walk with Him in humility. So praying this way in the morning will then set you in a place throughout the day to be mindful, to commune with God, talking to him throughout the day. So in this session, we've seen that prayer is a mark of servant leadership. We've seen that prayer should be and must be wedded to 
biblical interpretation. And finally, we've seen that prayer finds its pattern in the Bible, particularly in the Lord's Prayer. So my challenge for you is this. Consider, as a servant leader, how are you praying for other people? How are you interceding on their behalf? How are you wrestling for them in prayer? And as students, when you seek to do that work of biblical interpretation, as students of God's word, when you go to teach it to others, how are you incorporating and depending upon the help of the Lord through prayer when you teach or preach God's word? And finally, my challenge and question for you is this. How are you praying daily? What would it look like for you to begin to pray according to the pattern that Jesus gave us.